Well, hey, Good Shepherd, Pastor Jeremy here, just checking in to do another attribute of God tonight. Uh, I thought I would cover the attribute of God's omnipotence, His all-powerfulness. God is all-powerful. Um, uh, definition uh, at the top here, uh, God is all-powerful and fully capable of completing every aspect of His holy will. Another way to say this is to, is to say that God is able to do everything that is consistent with His holy character. It's, it wouldn't be accurate to say that God can do anything. Uh, we always want to understand the limitations of God as inside of Him, but never outside of Him. God is never constrained by anything beyond Himself. However, He is always constrained to be true to himself, to be who he is, in his essence. He cannot be other than uh, all that he is in all of his glory. And so he is able to do anything that is consistent with his holy will, with his character, with his person. And uh, there are no restraints up upon the power of God beyond God himself. So. Uh, th think of all of the ways that we experience um, powerlessness as we go through the day, right? We get tired. We get exhausted. Uh, if you're going to run, you're going to eventually wear out. Uh, if you uh, don't eat, then you, you wear down. You, our bodies are constantly reminding us that we are powerless. We, we uh, run low on energy. Uh, we need sleep. I think it's just an amazing gift of God to be reminded day after day after day that we are not uh, the source of infinite power, but we must rely upon a God who can recharge us at night and restore us and give us what we need for another day. That is never the case with God. He does not grow weary. He does not wear out. Uh, he does not ever... Uh, find himself uh, exhausted or uh, depleted in any way. Uh, sometimes uh, people will, you know, kids who are being taught about the creation, the six days of creation, uh, when they say that God rested on the seventh day, you know, he, he needed a nap. He, he was just exhausted or tired. No, absolutely not. God had as much energy and power on the seventh day as he did on the first day. He was not exhausted. He didn't need to rest because he was out of breath or uh, depleted because of the six days of his creative work. He rested on purpose to show us uh, a pattern of what we are called to. Six days we are to work and on the seventh day we are to rest. One of the things we see in the rest of God on the seventh day is his delight in all that he has made. And so, uh, it's interesting. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, you read this. Uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 19 and 20. What can be known about God in creation is, is plain to us because God has shown it to us. And then Paul says this in verse 20. For God's invisible attributes, namely, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So, we are without excuse. We, we certainly are without excuse. All those who suggest that there is no God, they know it. They, they know there is a God. It's instinctual. When you open your eyes in this world, and you look around, uh, keep your eyes on these flowers. There'll be a little hummingbird that comes and visits from time to time as I uh, teach here. Um, that is a display of the power of God with words to speak into being such glory and majesty in his creation. His power is declared day after day after day from supernovas and from the tiniest little thing. So from great to small. Um, our response when we come in contact with that is worship and awe. Worship and awe. Um, 
Listen from First Chronicles, uh, chapter 16. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. Declare His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord. Now what are we saying when we say that? He is powerful. He is glorious. Look at what He's done. Look at what He's made. He is greatly to be praised. He is to be held in awe above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His place. And then the call is, Ascribe to the Lord the glory uh, that is due His name. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Uh, bring an offering before Him. Worship Him in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Now, there is a piece of the omnipotence of God that should strike in us a rightful reverence and awe, a trembling before Him. When you realize the power that He has, the rule, the reign, the right that He has in, in His existence over all that is, He is God, He is Creator, He is Sustainer, He is Lord of all. The fear of God is a right response. It is a, a trembling before Him, a respect for Him, an honor, uh, a bowing before Him. Uh, no flippancy here in view of a God of omnipotence. You don't just uh, do, uh, you know, jump rope up to the throne. You, 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 you come with reverence. But really, we can come because of Christ. We're invited to come into the throne room of our Father. It's an amazing thing. So these, these all come together for us as Christians in this moment of, of reverence and awe in view of the power of God. So, uh, one piece of clarification I think it's, is important to, to remember is uh, the concept, you, you see this in Star Wars, for example. Um, it's the, uh, the good versus evil. The, it's the, the, the forces of, of, of light versus the forces of dark. Uh, almost this kind of yin-yang idea. Uh, and in Star Wars, at least, the idea is that there's some uh, equal balance that has to be struck in the Force. And so you have a certain amount of Jedi, and then you have, you know, the bad guys, the Sith and the evil people. And, uh, and somehow in that, there's supposed to be this balance, this tipping point where it's almost even. Uh, friends, that, that is just not the case with our God. There is no enemy of God that can hold a candle to the power and the, uh, the, the dominance of our God. He is sovereign. He rules. He reigns. And uh, certainly, there is no one who can stay His hand. There is no one who can, who, who can affect Him in a way that is beyond His control. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, what about Satan? What about Satan? Isn't he like uh, the, the bad side, like the dark forces? And isn't God waging a war against Satan? Well, friends, we wrestle against flesh and blood, but we are not God. We are called to carry his name. We are called to carry his message. We are his children. And that makes us targets of the enemy, Satan and the demons, yes. However, Satan is a created being. God spoke him into existence when he created the angels. Satan has absolutely no room to run but the room that God sovereignly ordains for him to have. Um, I like how uh, the Puritans would refer to Satan he is, as it were, a dog on a leash in the hand of our God. Now, if I had my little chihuahua out here, I could illustrate what that looks like. Um, God 
is in control. Uh, Satan is God's Satan. He wants to do evil. He wants to do, uh, you know, create chaos and disorder. And, and uh, all that was ordained by God is being accomplished exactly as he planned. And Satan fits into that plan. Now, how that all works out is really mysterious to us and beyond us. But one of the things you can see consistently in Scripture is when Satan goes and asks permission of the Father to do something. In fact, the passage I'm just going to be preaching this Sunday, uh, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded or asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Uh, so Satan has asked the Father to sift Peter like wheat. And Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. And so we'll, we'll look at that more on Sunday. Um, Job, for example, uh, here he is. Uh, Satan presents himself before the Lord and says, God, God says, have you considered my servant Job? And, and Job says, well, that's because he's, he's living a life of, of luxury and, and he hasn't really suffered. And God allows Satan to go this far, but no farther. So it's a great reminder for us as we do indeed wrestle with um, our great enemy. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with the enemy, Satan and his dominions. And we wrestle in the power of God. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Satan is God's Satan. He's only able to get permission from God. And that should reassure us, friends, because God is working all things together for our good. And just like Job bowed and worshipped at the end of his test, when he had been brought by grace through the fire of refinement, he tasted more of God. God gave him more of himself through the suffering that was inflicted by Satan. Just like Jesus was able to accomplish salvation and, and pay for our sins and then rise from the dead, conquering sin and Satan and death itself, offering life in his name. Just like that, we can stand. We can stand. We can find from God the power that is needed for us to stand firm, steadfast. Resist him and he will flee from you. Peter writes. Uh, we are girded with the armor of God, Ephesians 6. We have what we need in his power to stand against the enemy. And we can always be reminded he's just a dog on a leash in the hand of our great God. And so, friends, trust me, the end of the story is written. It's going to come to pass. Satan and all uh, demons will be dealt with in, in, in one final beautiful blow, they will be cast into the lake of fire where they will not haunt us, tempt us, come at us in any way for the rest of eternity. What a comfort that is. No more sin, no more Satan, no more death, uh, and only life and joy and peace. One of the things that is... Uh, important for us to then as we walk in this world is to be reminded that we are weak but he is strong his strength is all that we need he never runs low he is never uh, depleted he's never out of what we need but he calls us to come to him draw near to the throne of grace that we may find or receive what we need that we can receive the help receive the mercy that we need from God who is infinite in power. One of the ways that we do this is through prayer. I always like to tell people the reason that prayer is powerful is because God is powerful. Prayer in itself is not powerful. We don't, we don't just pray to nobody. We pray to the one who has all power in himself. And that's the reason that prayer is a powerful weapon that we wield. We pray in dependence. We, we pray in, in the name of Christ. We pray in His authority, His victory, and His triumph. 
And so, friends, as you study through these verses, there's some great verses here. You know, look these up and, and study them through. And then enjoy some of these questions as you just kind of delight in this attribute of God's omnipotence. He is all-powerful, and that should lead us to great worship and awe. Amen? All right. Go in peace.